Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Dr. Peter Plafchan, and I'd like to welcome you to our virtual evening under the stars at George Mason Observatory. Sorry that we can't be holding this event in person, but maybe it'll be our last event in person, as to be determined. Um, so uh, uh, I'm excited. This is our last uh, virtual evening under the stars for the semester. I know many of you are students here at Mason and uh, have finals to look forward to. Good luck uh, to all of you. Uh, here's a, uh, where we're located. Uh, if you don't know, we're on the Fairfax campus. Uh, of George Mason University atop a research hall. And uh, we're going to be bringing you some live views of the celestial uh, heavens tonight. Uh, and here are some example views taken by our own students uh, here at George Mason, including Jupiter, Saturn, the Ring Nebula, M82, the Horsehead Nebula, the Crab Nebula. And we'll be uh, virtually using this telescope remotely uh, tonight uh, shown here in the inset. So this, as I said, this is our last one uh, for the semester. It's been an interesting year. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe uh, during this pandemic. Hopefully by next fall, we'll be able to uh, get started with having events in person, uh, like shown in the pictures here. And we'd like to welcome you all to come back next year, even if you're graduating, come visit us and uh, come spend some time with us at the observatory. Uh, get to look through the eyepiece with your own eyes. There's always something special about that that you can't do necessarily from a computer. So uh, to find out more information about future events, you can uh, follow us on Twitter at GME Observatory. Or you can go to our website at science.gme.edu slash observatory. We may have some events over the summer, that's TBD. Uh, those most likely will be virtual, but we are most likely hoping to have in-person events this fall, but that depends upon uh, you know, uh, federal, state, and local guidance. To also keep up with our events, we have a newsletter called The Moon. It comes out once a month, and that's uh, not a coincidence. Our Mason Observatory Outreach Newsletter, you can sign up for it on our website. For those of you that are not students, although students are welcome, uh, to join uh, if you're an alumni we have a philanthropic organization called patrons of the observatory uh, and if you join and make a tax deductible donation you could support observatory activities as well as all the students that help make events like tonight possible now we have different patron levels and i'd like to thank our big bang galaxy supernova a new nova cluster and star members uh, we have uh, myself, I'm the director. We're joined tonight by Dr. Rob Parks, the deputy director. And I heard maybe that a lot of his students are here tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank our outgoing observatory graduate teaching assistant, William Matsko. He's gonna be doing research for his PhD thesis in the fall. And we do have Kevin Collins uh, who will be uh, joining us tonight and will also be uh, with us uh, in the fall. And I also like to say goodbye to outgoing president of Friends of the Observatory, our student organization, Brandon Iverson. They just elected new uh, officers. Congratulations to Jonathan Saldana, the new president of Photo, along with um, uh, the continuing officers, including Owen Alfaro and Savannah Barker. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our tour guides from the past year that have held a huge number of virtual tours including Mohammed, Ryan, Patrick, Owen, Ashley, Victor, Andrew, and Aiden. If you're interested in being a tour guide, which is paid uh, next academic year, uh, feel free to reach us, read out, reach out to us at gmuobservatory at gmail.com. Uh, if you have some experience with looking at telescopes, even if not, we can train you. Uh, and we look forward to having tours next fall. Again, whether or not they're in person or virtual is to be determined. Uh, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jenna Khan. Uh, she is a Mason product. Uh, she got her undergraduate degree from Mason, and her, she just received her PhD in physics from George Mason University this semester. She's just accepted a prize postdoctoral fellowship at NASA Goddard Space Flight Research Center, or GSFC for short, beginning this June. Uh, her research, or sorry, their research uh, focuses on determining new diagnostics to search for lower mass supermassive black holes in dwarf galaxies using theoretical simulations. 
and the infrared observations at, at Keck and Gemini Observatory in preparation for the launch of James Webb Space Telescope, which hopefully launch uh, later this year. Dr. Khan is also a co-founder of Spectrum. Now we'll put the link to the Spectrum website in the chat here in a little bit. It's a group focused on promoting mentorship and equity in STEM fields. And so if you're interested in contributing to, participating in, or joining STEM, I encourage you to reach out to them via their website. So without further ado, Dr. Khan, the floor is yours. So I'm like, let me just share my screen. Can I just steal it from you? Yeah. Okay. And at the conclusion of tonight's talk, we'll uh, have a Q&A for our speaker. So feel free to post questions in the chat. And then we'll have a tour with our telescope following the Q&A uh, starting at around 9 p.m. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Jenna. And like Peter said, I just finished my PhD at GMU this semester. I did a ton of work as a tour guide and a researcher at the observatory over my time here. So I'm really excited to be able to share a bit of my research with you all today. And so the first thing that I always like to point out in any of my talks, particularly those where I have a little bit more time like today, is how much of a group effort research is. So I've put here a list of my collaborators that were instrumental in the products that we're touching on today. And I want to especially acknowledge the names in color as those are graduate and undergraduate students in blue and in green. So first I wanted to start this talk the way we start most research products in astronomy. And that's by looking up and looking at pictures of the sky. So throughout this talk, I'm gonna bring up different tools that we use to look into a galaxy, but they all come back to images like this. So what do you notice? Not really a ton lit, right? You can see some bright sources that are stars, but if you look into the outlined region in the center, there's really not that much easily visible. Maybe we can see a small smudge in the corner, but I'm honestly not convinced that isn't just dust or something on my computer screen. So what about now? Now this is getting definitely a lot more interesting. We can see point sources, extended shapes, tiny spirals and dashes with a lot more color. Well, these two images actually show similar fields. This one is just covering a much smaller area and is a much deeper image. This is an image from the Hubble Deep Field, which is the fields noted in the outline region in this previous image. But while this image was taken over the course of a couple minutes, uh, this image was taken over the course of five days and with Hubble, which is one of our most sensitive observatories. With that extra time and extra care, a region of the sky that was thought to be nearly completely empty can be shown to be teeming with galaxies. In fact, pretty much every one of these dots, flashes, and spirals that we see in this image is a very distant galaxy. So one lesson that we can learn from this image is how you sometimes need a variety of tools and a variety of instruments to really be able to reach new understandings of our universe. So there are up to 1 trillion galaxies in the universe. And some common big questions that astronomers studying galaxies tend to ask are, how did they form? How did they evolve to the structures we see today? And what is their ultimate fate? So one way to get more clues uh, to the answers to the questions we take a closer, is to take a closer look at what is inside each of these galaxies and how they may interact with our host galaxy and affect its evolution. And you've probably recognized some of these pictures from the, from the images that Peter showed earlier. Um, so while each galaxy looks different in its own complex way, they are typically filled with similar building materials. And the ones that we mostly focus on in my research is stars, dust, and gas. And they can be seen in the images here of Orion's nebula, like you see in the center, um, which is a gas cloud of a uh, hydrogen gas cloud that's in star forming regions. So there's lots of also young stars there. You can see on the left a globular cluster, which is basically just a dense collection of stars. And then the horsehead nebula on the right, that is a cloud of gas and dust. And if we look at this picture of a spiral galaxy, we can see those building blocks. You can see the dark streaks of dust, uh, the gaseous spiral arms where star formation is really active, but there's something else hiding in here. And that's a supermassive black hole right in the center, about 40 million times the mass of our sun. And it happens to be actively feeding or accreting material around it, gobbling it up and emitting the excess energy. Now the presence and evolution of a supermassive black hole can subsequently greatly affect the host galaxy. So the study of these objects is very necessary to learn more about the evolution of galaxies. Now we can take a look at the center of this galaxy and see a big bright spot that could potentially be a sign towards the presence of this black hole and this accreting black hole. But most galaxies have bright spots in their centers. They're typically the densest part of the galaxy. And sometimes these sources can instead be attributed to a dense concentration of stars. 
So we need to take a closer look and use a couple different tools to really figure out what is going on here. Now, one of the most direct ways that we can detect a black hole is just kind of to stare at it for a while and observe the stars orbiting around it inside of its sphere of influence. So I have shown here a GIF of the data for the black hole in our own Milky Way, Sagittarius A star. And it's taken over a time period of around 14 years. And by observing the movement of these stars orbiting around the central black hole, the way our planets orbit the sun, we can determine information about how much mass is enclosed and maybe get an estimate for the size of the central black hole. That's how we figure out the mass estimate for our own black hole to be around 4 million times the mass of our sun. But as you can imagine, there are limits to what we can use this method for. The farther away a galaxy is, the finer resolution we will need to be able to really discern the movements of its stars. And that is impossible for galaxies outside the local universe. And black holes themselves do not give off light. They, by definition, are so massive and have such a strong, steep gravitational well that not even light can escape. So therefore, in many cases, a supermassive black hole can only be detected if it's actively feeding and accreting, which is what we call an active galactic nucleus or an AGN, as you'll hear me say throughout this talk. Now you can see artist rendition of an AGN to the left here, where you have the central black hole, and then you have the accretion disk around in orange kind of that's feeding the material. All of this is shrouded by this giant cloud of gas and dust. Now looking at accreting black holes enables us to use the light from the AGN to detect it, which is much, much brighter and easier to see than the light of a bunch of little stars orbiting around the black hole. And the spectrum of light is so much more than what we can see with our eyes. So many, many instruments, as you can see up here over the years, um, have been created to, to help us observe the target in different wavelengths of light. And the cage gives a different picture of the target. Now, this also requires the use of both ground and space-based observatories, because ground-based observatories can only observe in a few small pockets, like you see here in the optical, which is what we can see with our eyes, in the infrared, and in the radio. This is because our atmosphere is made up of various different gases and elements, and they absorb the light of specific wavelengths. They basically eat up all the photons that we're trying to collect in most, and of course, most of the wavelengths. Also, our atmosphere, like other balls of gas in space, can radiate its own emission. And that can draw out light from other sources if we're trying to look at wavelengths similar to where you know, the peak emission of the atmosphere is. So we really need a very diverse group of instruments to really get the full picture of what we're looking at in the galaxy. And you can see that in the various pictures that I have shown here from both ground and space observatories. Um, now, all of these are pictures of the same galaxy. It's actually an image of the central part of our own Milky Way. So if you were to go out west past Manassas and look up at the Milky Way, you would see something that looks kind of like this image here, or more like this one, which is kind of how it would look closer to the naked eye. But this doesn't give us all the information we're looking for. The image is dominated by stellar light, and you can see a bunch of dust here obscuring our vision. So that's why astronomers create a wide range of telescopes that can look into a wide range of wavelengths. So for example, we have the radio wavelengths up here, the infrared down here that are observed by uh, telescopes like the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer or WISE, optical here that we see with our own eyes and with the campus telescope, and down here, uh, x-rays that you can see with it's like the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And we can also look at the spectra, where the light is dispersed through a prism and reveals the mission lines that correspond to specific elements and ions. So another way that you can think of spectroscopy is if the light we see is like a giant ball of rubber bands. You can tell what it is, just a bunch of rubber bands, but it's only once you start to peel apart the layers that you see exactly what are the sizes and the shapes and thicknesses and colors of each of the component bands. And so just like that, it's only when we start to kind of unravel the light that we can see really what the different component emission features are. And this can give us information about the energy of the emitted light and the abundances of different elements in our target. You can see in the top right image here, where we compare a continuous spectrum, just a pure white light, compared to the emission spectra of several different elements, such as hydrogen and calcium, which are two that sometimes appear in the spectra of galaxies. And to see what that looks like, here is a sample spectrum of a galaxy. And you can see the two large peaks here and here that correspond to particular ions of hydrogen and oxygen. And so the emission lines shown here are also used in diagnostics to give information about the source of radiation. I use one pretty regularly that can help group AGNs between, group galaxies in between AGNs or active galaxies and star formation dominated galaxies. So with this background information, we can finally start talking about supermassive black holes. Um, and we can really get into interesting questions about this field. So the two main questions that most of the research in my field seeks to answer are how are supermassive black holes formed and how do they grow and evolve? And the main question that really got me hooked in this field is how are they formed? 
because there's a lot of really interesting mysteries here. Because the speed of light is finite, if we look at things that are far away, the light rays take a really long time to get to us, and that can allow us the opportunity to kind of look into the past. And several years ago, a group of astronomers did just that, and they looked at galaxies very, very far away from when the universe was less than a billion years old. And they found a supermassive black hole 12 billion times the mass of our sun. Now, this black hole, despite being far earlier in the history of the universe compared to us, it is 3,000 times the mass of the supermassive black hole uh, found in our own Milky Way. And so this started to poke some holes into our initial theories, because at this point, we thought the main way black holes formed was the way we see them formed in our own galaxy, that you know they form as, they form as end products of supernova. But the black holes that we see in the early universe are far too massive to be able to grow, have grown from the relatively small sizes of the black holes formed from supernova. So either this is a fluke or some kind of error, or there is something kind of big that we're missing. These results were published and several more surveys were done, and it turns out that it really wasn't a fluke, that there are actually hundreds of these giant monsters hiding out in the early universe. So with that information, we definitely need to revisit our initial ideas of the formation of these objects. And there are three main pathways that emerge as the most likely options. The first model is kind of the original one, that in the early universe, stars were more massive than we see today. And when they supernova, like all massive stars do, they're gonna form black holes that would then have to merge together, grow really quickly, whether it's by merging together with other nearby black holes to form a, a bigger black hole. The second flips the order of that, where massive stars first merge together to form a giant star, that supernovas and forms a bigger black hole. And the final potential pathway is what we call the direct collapse model. And the general idea of this model is that we take a cloud of very hot gas and put it in a very precise, perfect environment, throw as much physics as we can into it until it finally collapses into a black hole, the biggest version, biggest end product of all of these three pathways. And so the two biggest clues that we are looking at to try to figure out which of these pathways is the most common, is the one that actually happens the most, um, is basically what are the size of what we call intermediate mass black holes and what are their frequency in the local universe? So do we typically see one in every galaxy or are they relatively rare? So each of the seed models that we discussed uh, have predictions for what the population of intermediate mass black holes would look like in the local galaxy. So if we're looking at the primordial star well, it's the model here, so the one basically where just stars supernova and then the black holes grow very quickly, we would expect them to have relatively low masses because it's really, really hard to get the exact perfect conditions for a small black hole to grow very rapidly. That being said, we'd expect to see them to be expect them to be very common because they're pretty easy to make. Every massive star is going to eventually supernova at some point in its life. It's just a matter of time, basically. We just kind of wait, we see a neural galaxy, we don't expect it to be any different in the early universe. Now on the flip side, if we're looking at the direct collapse model over here on the right, uh, we would expect to see much relatively larger intermediate mass black holes because they're starting at a much bigger starting point than the other models, but they're also much rarer than the, than the other models because it requires such precise conditions to make that it would be pretty hard to make a whole bunch of them. And the runaway merger model, the one where basically a bunch of stars merge together first and then supernova would be somewhere in the middle, both in mass and frequency. So now we finally got into intermediate mass black holes. And the easiest way I found to actually describe what these are is to talk about the two extremes, basically talk about what they aren't. So the black hole on the left, uh, the image on the left, we have an image of M87 from the Event Horizon Telescope. The black hole pictured there is about 7 billion times the mass of our sun. And it's considered a supermassive black hole in the same category as the one in our own galaxy, as the one in our near neighbor Andromeda. Uh, and on the right, we have an image of Cygnus X1 taken by Chandra. And this has a stellar mass of around 20 times the mass of our sun. And it's formed from the supernova massive star. So while we know there are supermassive black holes millions and billions of times the mass of our sun in the centers of nearly all massive galaxies, and we know that there are stellar mass black holes formed from the death of a massive star, there is currently no direct evidence for black holes with masses between around 150 to 10,000 yeah, times the mass of our sun. And this is the range that we call intermediate mass black holes, or IMBH, this is I'll probably shorten this throughout the talk. Now, this is a significant deficiency because black holes in this mass range can provide insight into the big questions we posed a few slides earlier. They can provide information onto the seed models, the most likely formation pathways, and they can also be sources for information about how these black holes evolve, whether it's either secularly kind of by itself in its own galaxy um, or as a product of mergers. 
In fact, mergers between black holes is now starting to be one of the prime targets uh, for LISA, which is one of the next, the next gravitational wave observatory scheduled to launch in the 2030s. So now we watch our telescopes and we start looking for these. But there's a lot of difficulties when it comes to scaling the same methods we use to find supermassive black holes down to their intermediate mass counterparts. First, the vast majority of them cannot be detected kinematically by observing the motions of stars the way we did in our own galaxy. Their spheres of influence are just much too small for telescopes to resolve, even in these really nearby galaxies. And when we get into intermediate mass black hole powered AGNs, they're much smaller than their supermassive counterparts and can easily be drowned out by the light of active star formation in the galaxy. And the dust that I mentioned before can really further obscure the light from the AGN, making it almost impossible to see. That being said, all is not lost yet. There have been several successes over the last few years in finding intermediate mass black holes uh, in local galaxies uh, using some traditional AGN tools in the optical infrared and x-rays. As you can see two examples on the right. Um, and then on the lower end, we have LIGO pictured up here is a gravitational wave observatory, um, which uses gravitational waves to observe mergers like the one pictured below, the mock up pictured below, uh, between stellar mass black holes. And they recently found one that was around 150 times the mass of our sun. But that being said, there are very few of these compared to the supermassive black holes found in pretty much every massive galaxy. And the detections are mostly concentrated in environments that avoid the issues mentioned in the previous slide. That being said, maybe we have our answer. It must be direct collapse because we're finding relatively few. And they're at typically at the higher end of the mass range, unless we are look, using the wrong tools to look for these objects. So, so far, we have been assuming that intermediate mass black holes behave exactly the same as supermassive ones. Their emission is the exact same, just scaled down because they're going to be dimmer. But what if that assumption is wrong? And what if the emission from an IMBH is inherently different from that of a supermassive black hole? While we don't have enough data on actual intermediate mass black holes to know for sure, Theoretical modeling is showing that this probably is not the case and that the emission from an IMBH might be inherently different from that of a supermassive counterpart. And to dive into this, we need to think about why AGNs emit light, because by definition, light cannot escape from a black hole. So as material falls into the black hole, the energy it loses is being converted into light radiation. Now, in a smaller mass black hole, that accretion disk um, is that it supplies the material to the black hole is closer to the center, as you can see in the right image here, compared to the kind of supermassive mock-up on the left. Now, when the black hole, when the accretion disk is closer in, that causes the accretion disk to heat up to higher temperatures and subsequently emit light at higher energies. And that can potentially dramatically change the emission that we're looking for. So with that idea, much of my research has been focused on looking at emissions from ions that require very high energies to be produced, and they're called coronal ions. Now, these ions require very high energies, and because stars do not emit enough energy, uh, high energy radiation to produce these ions in any kind of magnitude that we can see, the presence of these emission lines can be near definitive proof of an AGM. This can be seen in this plot over here, where I show emission from a stellar population in orange and an AGN in blue. And as you can see, the orange stellar population cuts off pretty quickly, whereas the AGN keeps going and going. It can produce higher and higher, higher and higher ions. Now these coronal lines have been used in the past to confirm the presence of an AGN and to learn more about them, but they haven't been used as an initial discovery tool, and they have not been explored in the IMBH regime. So with the launch of James Webb Space Telescope scheduled to finally launch on Halloween of this year, we will have access to a much wider range of these lines at much, much higher sensitivities than have been available to us before. So we wanted to explore this idea and see how realistic it is uh, using preliminary experiments of the observatories currently available to us. So let's test these diagnostics. And our first experiment was to take a multi-wavelength look at a galaxy much like the ones we plan to observe with JWST. And so for this, we chose 1056. And we're going to compare the traditional diagnostics for finding AGNs to our suggestion of coronal lines. Now, as I mentioned before, different wavelengths and diagnostics can tell us different things about a given galaxy. So we're going to try to nail down what method provides us the most complete, most definitive picture of this galaxy. And because they're working with many different diagnostics that require many different specialties, I got the opportunity to work with a lot of my collaborators, which is always really fun. So I'm going to call them out as we get to their participation. So let's take our first look at the galaxy. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, image of 1056. And we can see that it's fairly point source-like, which makes sense given its relatively low mass of about half a percent the mass of the Milky Way, and its distance of approximately 2 billion light years. But aside from that, there's really not much else that we can get from this image. So let's start looking into the other diagnostics. 
If we stay in the optical, but look in the spectra also from SDSS, uh, we can see the relative strengths of various emission lines imply the emission is primarily from stellar origins, which usually means from active star formation. So if there is an AGN in there, it's light is being drowned out by the bright emission of zillions of stars, as shown by the stars that are dominating this image of 1056. And one other piece of information that the spectra gives us is that this galaxy is likely has a similar environment, environment to that found in the early galaxies. We see a much higher abundance of hydrogen and much less of other elements, meaning that there probably haven't been too many generations of stars fusing elements together to create new ones and then enriching the gas. We can also see signatures in the spectra of very fast gas movement, which can be attributed to gas clouds rapidly moving around the nucleus of the galaxy at around 800 kilometers per second which corresponds to a potential black hole of approximately 2 million times the mass of our sun. Now, these velocities are very, very difficult to get from stellar processes alone, but they could be attributed to supernova. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, my cat. <laughs> but they could be attributed to supernova, so we'll have to take a closer look at this uh, and compare it with the other evidence. And the analysis used uh, down here used the expertise of Rem Sexton, who is now a postdoc at the United States Naval Observatory in DC. <laughs> And so we also saw high ionization lines in the optical spectrum. And so while these are nominally considered coronal lines, they don't require as high energy photons to produce as what I typically am looking for and have seen in the stellar sources. Although they have been seen in stellar sources. Even so, they are still pretty, they still give pretty decent evidence for the presence of an AGN. Uh, so to recap the optical wavelengths, we have some strong evidence for an AGN, but there's still some evidence that is ambiguous and could be either attributed to stellar or AGN sources. So let's take a look at the diagnostics in another uh, wavelength regime, the infrared. So if we look at the infrared images from the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE, as I mentioned earlier, we see signatures of very, very hot dust. And the temperature of this dust is too hot for it to be heated by stars, except in the most extreme environments. So this gives us a little bit more evidence to the presence of an AGN. But like we said before, images can only tell us so much unresolved targets like this one. So let's take a look at the spectra. So this section was taken uh, from the Keck Observatory in Mauna Kea with the help of Thomas Bone, a grad student picture here at the University of California, Riverside. And this section revealed more evidence of rapid gas cloud movement. And since this data was taken about 14 years after the initial SDSS spectra, we can safely say this movement is not due to any kind of transient feature like a supernova. And it's pretty much guaranteed to be due to some kind of central AGM. We also found another coronal line, one that required a much higher ionization energy than those found in the optical. So that's also pretty definitive evidence for an AGM. And now we have the infrared diagnostics leaning pretty heavily towards the AGM. Um, but let's take one look into the last common method used to find AGM in the X-rays. And to do this, I asked for some help from my friend and fellow grad student here at GMU, Ryan Feisley, pictured up here. And so with, with observations from Chandra, we detected an X-ray source in the center of a galaxy, which gives further evidence of the presence of an AGM. However, it was much dimmer than expected, and we were honestly barely able to detect it. So while this, is, while this diagnostic technically worked, it could have caused some pretty big problems. The source could have easily been mistaken for a stellar source or honestly missed altogether. So now let's take a look at the evidence and see if we can figure out what exactly is going on in this galaxy. As far as evidence for an AGM, we've got the coronal lines, we've got the hot dust signatures. As far as evidence against, we've got the star forming domination, the optical spectrum. And the two pieces of evidence that could go either way are the fast gas movements and the dim X-ray sources. So the presence of the features, however, identifying the gas velocities and the rest of the evidence kind of helps tip both of those into the evidence score category. And that gives us the verdict of an AGM. <laughs> And it's also looking like the best tools to find AGNs in this demographic, at least, maybe in the infrared, as all of our infrared diagnostics gave us pretty solid evidence towards the presence of an AGN. And there was some amount of ambiguity in the others. So what next? If you remember, the estimated mass for the black hole powering the AGN in 1056 was about 2 million times the mass of our sun. But if we're looking for intermediate mass black holes, we're going to want to go smaller than that. We're going to want to find smaller black holes. And the way to do that is to start looking into smaller galaxies. And so the other galaxy I wanna talk briefly about today is 1601, which is the target of our second experiment. Now this galaxy like 1056 also has an environment similar to those in the early galaxies, but this one is much smaller at about 0.02% the mass of our Milky Way, or around 5% that of 1056. 
Now this galaxy has no signatures of AGN uh, in the optical wavelengths. So that's not necessarily a deal breaker because if you remember 1056 also had a good amount of ambiguity in there as well. And we're really more interested in the infrared. So if we look at the infrared diagnostics that we use with 1056, we find more hot dust that is indicative of potential AGN and another high ionization corona line. There aren't any signatures of gas clouds moving around in the fast velocities there. So we can't estimate the mass of the black hole candidate the way we did in 1056. But by looking at the mass of the galaxy, we can very, very roughly put it at around 100,000 times the mass of our sun. Now, this is still above the regime. We're really interested in the study in immediate mass black holes, but we're getting closer. And we're showing that these diagnostics do work as we go lower and lower in mass. So how do we actually observe the mass range that we're interested in? For that, we have to go into space with NASA's upcoming mission, the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST. And you can see two of its instruments pictured here, NERSA second NERI, it's near infrared and mid infrared spectrometers. So why is JWST so exciting to astronomers? And what can James Webb do to, that all the other observatories that we have on space, in space and on the ground can't? So for the answer to that, let's ask the lemur. So what did you notice? What did the music seem to be dramatically drawing your attention to? Now, I can't really see because no one has their videos on this time and we're not doing this in person, but I hope you noticed it was the eyes. You can see their eyes opening up really, really wide. Now these animals are typically active at night, so there isn't a whole lot of light to see around them. And to adapt for this, they've evolved to have huge eyes. so They can take in as much light as possible to help them see. And you can also see this in your own eyes. If you're trying to look around in a dark room for a while, your pupils will dilate to allow more light in and help you out. If you walk into a bright room or turn on the light after that, your pupils will shrink because they don't need all that extra light anymore. So how does this relate to telescopes? Well, you can think of the mirror as the eyes of the telescope. Now, just as the lemur widens its eyes to get in more light, astronomers use larger and larger telescopes to be able to see fainter and fainter objects. Now, right now, the Hubble Space Telescope is one of astronomers' go-to for sensitivity. But James Webb will have a primary mirror six times larger than that of Hubble, allowing it to see much dimmer objects and delve even further into cosmic time. And we can actually take a look at a quick time lapse of the Sphere So the Sphere is actually built relatively nearby, and NASA got already free out there. I'm talking there. Um, while these mirrors are much larger than HST, they're actually less massive, around 17 times less than Hubble. Uh, that's because while Hubble's mirrors are, mirrors are made of thick glass, James Webb's are made from very thin, lightweight mirror segments, as you can see when it turns around right there. And these, uh, this mirror is also coated in gold, as you can see the color there. And it actually, this is to optimize it for infrared light, and it actually takes about one golf ball's worth of gold to cover the entire mirror, resulting in a coating about one hundredth the thickness of a human hair. And the really cool thing about all these mirror segments is that it allows us to fold and unfold the mirror, which helps it to fit inside a rocket much easier, but we have to kind of unfurl it when it gets into space. And we can see a quick uh, video of the deployment right here. So it takes about one month to reach its final destination after launching, which is about 1.5 million kilometers away. And its orbit is at a point where the Earth is always in between JWST and the sun. Because it is so far away, it is not meant to be serviceable. There are no handholds that are going on it. It's going to be <laughs> a bit scary. Um, and you can see right now there's the, they're kind of pushing out some things. If we scoot a little bit forward, we have the unfurling of the sun shield. So this sun shield is actually five layers get progressively cooler from the conduction of heat. And because the, the vacuum between each layer is a pretty good insulator. And you can see it doing a little bit at a time. And trust me, there's five of these, it's a long video. <laughs> and so if we go here, that was the deployment of the secondary mirror. And this part right here is the most terrifying part according to all of my friends who are on the mission, because for the mirror to unfold and actually be usable and not just kind of trash up in space, the mirror segments have to be perfectly positioned with any variations being less than a fraction of the observing wavelengths, 
which corresponds to over 10,000 times less than the width of a human hair. So that's going to be a really fun time for them when that's happening. So once Shadev UST gets to its final location and is ready and operational to take our observations, let's talk about what Webb can do. Now, if you can remember back to the beginning of the presentation, I showed you this image of the Hubble Deep Field. This image shows some of the earliest galaxies that we were able to see with our current instrumentation. With JWST, we'll be able to go even further, potentially seeing some of the first galaxies. And you can also see that in this plot here, where we show kind of the limits of what our current instrumentation could take us and where we expect James Webb to take us pretty much further back to almost nearly the first stars. Now, James Webb's, James Webb's ability to appear in the infrared also really helps with this. So I mentioned that light has a finite speed and so that it takes time to get to us and that looking at things far away means that we are looking at the past. But the universe is also constantly expanding. So not only is the light from those distant sources traveling to get to us, it's also getting stretched out. So ultraviolet and visible light at these great distances gets stretched out or what we call redshifted into the infrared. And now aside from the redshift, these assistant sources are also very dim. So James Webb's large mirror will also be a huge help for this work. And this really is the next step of my work. My advisor and I got amazing news a couple of weeks ago that our proposal was selected for the first cycle of James Webb observations. And this will really help push the boundaries of research in our intermediate mass black holes and hopefully detect one of the most extreme examples. So we're taking follow-up data on 1601 that I mentioned in experiment number two. Because we want to see if the extra wave, the extra uh, coronal lines available from James Webb's extended wavelength range uh, will help us see more coronal lines and help us see something that weren't really visible from the ground. We've also selected a pretty exciting low mass target that, despite being one one hundred thousandth of a percent the mass of the Milky Way and two orders of magnitude below the lowest mass galaxies known to host AGN so far, shows the same hot dust signatures that were our first clues to the presence of an AGN in 1066 and in 1601, our first two experiments. So we're gonna again look out for a lot more coronal lines of this new mission. And so just to summarize, intermediate mass black holes are black holes with masses between around 150 to 10,000 uh, 10, times the mass of our sun. And they may provide major clues to the origins of the supermassive black holes found in nearly all massive galaxies. The current diagnostics used to find supermassive black holes have a lot of trouble when you try to scale them down. So we've been experimenting with new ideas to more effectively find these elusive objects. One method that has been successful so far is using highly ionized coronal lines because only an accreting black hole can produce enough high energy radiation to make these ions and produce these emission lines. We found these lines in two galaxies that are potential analogs of early environments where black hole seeds were formed. But to really probe the most extreme environments, the lowest masses and the more distant sources, we really need JWST, which is scheduled to launch this fall. And so with that, I'll thank you all for taking time to listen to me, especially during the week before finals. Uh, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Khan. All right, so that was a wonderful talk. And I'd like to go ahead and open the floor to questions. So if anyone would like to ask a question of our speaker, feel free to post it in the chat. I'll uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. We had some questions earlier to talk about what kind of animal was that? Uh, so I thought it was a lemur. And my advisor, actually, I saw come in the waiting room. And it's her video. So it's so Shabita. <laughs> I think you told me it was a lemur. If that is wrong, correct me. <laughs> Thumbs up, it's a lemur. <laughs> Probably a good guess. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess I'll ask a question. Um, so what are you off to do next uh, for your postdoc? What are you going to be doing as a postdoctoral scholar? So I'm going to be an NASA Goddard, like you said, and I'm going to kind of be splitting my time between some infrared projects that I've had going. So we have a whole sample of other galaxies like the 56 and 1601 that we have data on. Now I'm going to be working on that. I'm going to be helping Shabita and whatever future student takes over the JWST uh, thing, JWST project with that whole set, that whole side of everything. And I've also got a pretty interesting uh, project kind of dumpster diving in the XM archives to try to find more uh, 
analog galaxies like this and see if we can find any information about their X-ray properties. Yeah, so you've mentioned a bit about X-ray astronomy of black holes as a means of identifying them. Do you work at all with UV astronomy as an AGN diagnostic? I don't really at all. It's not something our group does. Um, one of the over the, you skip over that whole part of that. You know, we pretty we pretty much do. Well, one of the people in our one of the people at Goddard, um, Susan Neff does some stuff with UV, and so I might get involved with that when I'm here. But we mostly deal with infrared and X-ray, and that's it. <laughs> ah, it's interesting. Uh, is it is it mainly you think that the, just the big wavelength range that helps as opposed to if, you know UV's kind of in the middle, so maybe it doesn't offer as much contrast in, in wavelength? So the most UV, I don't necessarily say that. So I know I know some of the UV basically is just because of, I imagine just the absorption of it coming into the galaxy and everything. We can't get that much real refined data that we can, spectra that we can from other things. We do have some coronal lines that I look at around 3000 angstroms and that the neon five ones. And so that's, but that's kind of the most UV that are most of the papers that I read. I'm really not familiar with that, with the rest of that work. Okay, great. Thank you, Ian, for that question. And then we have a, a question from uh, Dr. Parks. Is there an expectation as to the distribution of supermassive black hole mass in, in this intermediate range? Like, do you have an idea what the mass spectrum would look like? So or like something? I said, right now, we're kind of seeing a leveling out. And that is expected as, as to the direct collapse model, basically, because we expect there to be kind of this 10 to the, this 10 down solar mass black hole, which is a seed mass, and all the black holes that we see kind of asymptotically approach that. If we get the, if they end up being more um, stellar mass or one of the other pathway, pathways, we're going to see a little bit more of a distribution, basically, where there might be a bunch down at the middle, less, like a bunch down, like, you know, the hundred solar masses, a couple at a thousand, and then more up at the top. Um, we really don't have a ton of data on this yet. I mean, most people I think are kind of leaning towards the dark collapse model where that, because that's what we're seeing right now is there is this asymptotically hitting that mass. But we don't have nearly enough examples to do statistics on. Need a bigger sample, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, thank you for that. All right, our next question comes from Chris Stout. So when a star dies and leaves a nebula, what causes the material within that nebula to slow down? Is it residual gravity caused by the density within the center of the nebula? Okay, this is, not, <laughs> uh, this is going back to when I was a tour guide. Um, I actually, I would, that sounds reasonable to me. I actually don't know. Peter, what do you know? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, <laughs> So I think once it hits escape velocity, it just keeps going more more than so it does slow down. So one of the things that could cause material from an expanding, um, you know, supernova explosion or, um, you know, uh, planetary nebula slow down is when it collides with the interstellar medium. So so those collisions, I guess, could on average slow the expansion rate. But for the stuff that doesn't collide with anything, it probably just keeps going and going. And it, the only thing it does it fades and cools. Uh, the time. Great, thanks for that question. All right, do we have uh, any other questions for our speaker? We have a wonderful talk. Okay. Yes, that's it. Thank you all. Let's let's give a virtual round of applause for our speaker. We've got the little claps uh, feature on um, uh, on Zoom, and you can all put up some applauses for our speaker. And thank you, Dr. Colin, for joining us and congratulations on your PhD and your postdoctoral position. And uh, we're now going to turn it over to our observatory TAs to tell us about the night sky tonight. Okay, thank you, Peter. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So unfortunately, it does look like we're going to have to do a closed dome tour tonight. Uh, the weather uh, and clouds uh, doesn't look like it's going to be cooperating with us. So that's unfortunate. Oh, well, but uh, we will have more of these events in the fall and uh, we might have some over summer. So we do encourage you to come back and uh, we'll we'll be bound to have some clear weather eventually. So, whoops. Oh, boy. Uh, that always happens. All right. Back to VNC. Okay. 
So uh, what I'm uh, currently looking at is a desktop of one of the computers in the control room. So one of the things that makes it possible to view or operate the telescope remotely is that we have a series of webcams at the observatory. So we can uh, monitor uh, the telescope and make sure nothing strange is happening. So if I pull those webcams up, uh, we can see that we have three uh, different views. The bottom right one here that says no signal, uh, that camera is in a box. So we don't really expect a signal from that. So in the top right, we have the control room. So we are currently connected to this computer here in the middle left. Uh, we have a backup computer that is, you can't see too well, but it's uh, in the lower left here. And it's in theory, a clone of this primary computer where we do, uh, all, and we do all of our software testing and whatnot on this backup computer. But uh, people, uh, when, we're, when we are at the observatory in person, uh, we would operate the telescope in this room and student observers would spend uh, most of the night uh, collecting data in this nice little cozy room. But now they can collect all their data from the comfort of their own uh, beds and apartments. Okay. And then in the bottom left, uh, we have an outside view of the observatory. So we have the dome here and the telescope is located in this building. There's a door frame uh, for height uh, for some kind of a scale. It's about six and a half feet tall. And you can also notice that uh, we have uh, some pretty thick clouds. So unfortunately we can't open uh, the dome tonight. So uh, it is what it is. And then finally, in the top left panel, we have our telescope. So this is our primary telescope. It's what our student researchers use uh, to collect data. It's what uh, we use to conduct tours and all that. So right now we are currently looking down the barrel of it. So we can see that we have this big shiny thing in the back that's reflecting a bunch of light. And that thing is actually the primary mirror of our telescope. So it is 32 inches in diameter. And the way this works is that light will come in uh, to this big opening and it will bounce off this primary mirror. And then it will bounce up about two thirds of the way up the tube to this uh, contraption right here. And this is our secondary mirror. And that's about a foot in diameter. So light will then bounce off that secondary mirror. It will go through this hole in the primary mirror. You can see we have a kind of cylinder uh, cut out in the cone or in the mirror. And it, light will uh, uh, travel through there and where and then it will bounce off a uh, third mirror, a diagonal reflector mirror that will bounce the light into one of the four instruments that we have on the back of the telescope. So uh, this telescope uh, costs about $300,000. Uh, so a lot of people uh, think that the telescope is on the order of a uh, million dollars and it's a common guess when I ask people what they think the price is. So I wish it was a million dollars, but uh, it's uh, just a piddly 300,000. Uh, the dome itself is about 80,000. And this telescope actually isn't all that old. It was installed in about 2011. And in 2018, 2019-ish, we poured about $150,000 worth of upgrades into it. So those upgrades were mainly focused on pointing uh, the telescope and making sure that uh, when we tell the telescope to go somewhere, that it goes exactly where we tell it. So one of the ways, uh, or the way we interface with the telescope uh, is with this software, and it's uh, very convenient, very simple. We can literally just point and click. So what we're looking at here is an overlay of the night sky as it appears uh, to us in Fairfax. So this is an you know, what the sky would look like if it was not cloudy outside. So this yellow dot just represents where our telescope is currently uh, pointing. We're very near the horizon looking at the webcam. And if we just move the telescope, we can take a look at the webcam and we can see that it is moving. So. This is indeed a live view. We can uh, indeed you know, control things remotely. 
So uh, that is the telescope and observatory in a nutshell. So uh, if Kevin is ready, he can talk to you about uh, some of the uh, images uh, that we've taken with this telescope when the weather was a bit clearer. So Kevin? Sure, thanks. Well, um, let's see. The first thing we're gonna look at here is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, and it's a spiral galaxy you can see here in the middle uh, that's interacting with a smaller dwarf galaxy you can see there above it. And uh, one interesting thing about the Whirlpool Galaxy is uh, it is a host to an AGN like uh, Dr. Ken was talking about in her, um, in her talk. Um, it's about 23 million light years away from Earth and it's about 75,000 light years across. Um, it's a fairly decent sized galaxy. It's about three quarters the mass of our Milky Way. Uh, and it's, it's a very easy to spot, uh, even for amateur astronomers, uh, on a very clear night with uh, low uh, light pollution and things like that. You can actually see the Whirlpool uh, galaxy with some decent binoculars. Um, let's see. Uh, may I ask uh, a quick question? Sure. Uh, what's the uh, smaller but also galaxy-looking object yes. above it? Uh, that it's it's a, a dwarf galaxy that's that's interacting with the Whirlpool galaxy. I don't actually know. It's I don't think it has a, a fancy name. I think it just has kind of like a number designation. Um, but yeah, it's it's just a, a dwarf galaxy just interacting on on the edges, uh, cool. and you can see all the little the little points of light are stars uh, in our galaxy. Uh, they're obviously much closer, and then each and then this galaxy far away are uh, composed of billions of stars themselves. Um, you might also notice uh, this image is in color. Um, when we, if we did an open dome tour, uh, the images that we take wouldn't actually appear to be in color. Uh, our camera gives us black and white images. And uh, what we do is uh, we have a process of false coloring uh, where we can take uh, images in different uh, light filters with different wavelengths of light. And we can assign those different images to different colors and basically layer them on top of each other uh, to get nicer looking color images. So uh, in one sense, it's unfortunate that you don't get to uh, see our open dome tour where we're taking live images of the sky. But um, one benefit is you get to see these nice post-processed images uh, with, with the colors assigned to them. Uh, the next thing we'll look at, stick with the theme, it's another galaxy. Uh, this is M82, also known as the Cigar Galaxy. Uh, it gets its name because of the shape, because we're viewing it side on, it looks kind of like a uh, cigar. And uh, this galaxy is notable, uh, not just because of it, its apparent shape, but it's also uh, the closest starburst galaxy. Uh, to the Milky Way. It's about 12 million light years away. And uh, starburst galaxy is one that has a much higher than usual rate of star formation. So um, the Cigar Galaxy has a close neighbor called Bode's Galaxy, and they interact gravitationally. And that interaction has caused a huge amount of uh, gas to fall in towards the center of the galaxy. And this has caused um, really, really rapid star forming regions, um, which are called like starburst regions. Uh, and so this is kind of the prototypical example of a starburst galaxy because it's so close and bright. Um, you can't see it in this image. But if you look up uh, images of the Cigar Galaxy uh, just on your own, you'll also see there are bright uh, plumes of red uh, coming out the all around the top and bottom 
of the the main portion of the galaxy, uh, and that's those are um, hydrogen gas uh, that is kind of expelled out uh, from the galaxy, and we can't see them here just due to the uh, filters used to actually take the image. Um, let's see. Suppose we can pass it back to Will for our final object. And if you have any questions about anything, including the telescope or these images, uh, just put them in the chat and one of us will respond. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kevin. And the last object uh, that we'll take a look at uh, tonight is also a galaxy, surprise, uh, sticking with the galaxy theme tonight. So this is uh, an image that was actually taken quite recently. So this is probably one of the better images that we've actually been able to make. It was taken by undergraduate tour guide uh, Owen Alfaro. And you'll notice uh, we have quite a lot of detail here. So this is actually uh, the uh, a spiral galaxy called M66, and it's in the constellation Leo. Now, this is actually part of what's called the Leo triplet. So there are three other galaxies uh, fairly nearby, but we can't see them uh, in this image. The field of view is a bit too small, so we can just see this galaxy. So M66 is the brightest of the Leo triplet, and it's about 31 million light years away from us, and its diameter is about 95,000 light years. So as I said earlier, one of the striking things about this galaxy is that you have these amazing spiral arms that are quite, uh, even in this, you know, false color image, you can still see that they're quite blue and you have these various tints and dark patches, which are dust lanes in the spiral arms. But in these uh, intense uh, blue uh, patches, you have lots of star formation going on. And then in these darker areas, uh, the dust lanes, you have dust, uh, lots of dust that is absorbing light and preventing it from reaching us. So that's why it appears dark. So you'll also notice that it has an incredibly bright center. So this galaxy was actually interacting with one of its uh, neighbors uh, in the Leo triplet uh, a long time ago in the very distant past. And that interaction caused a lot of mass uh, to funnel in towards the center of the galaxy and trigger this uh, AGN. Uh, I believe it's an AGN uh, in the center. So. Uh, yeah, you have this incredibly bright, uh, compact and dense uh, center uh, of the galaxy and you can't quite see it in this image, but the core is a little bit offset uh, from uh, the center of the galaxy. So that is also just a consequence of the interaction uh, with uh, the neighboring galaxy a long time ago. So yeah, I think this is one of the more impressive images that we've been able to take here. So thank you to Owen for imaging that. So that uh, is all uh, I have to say about this galaxy. So if there are any questions about uh, any objects we've shown or anything in general, uh, we can try and answer that. Uh, I do have another question. Uh, about um, okay. uh, this one right now, M M sixty six. Oh, mm -hmm. what causes like there to be such a higher density of stars in the center? Is it just like a larger black hole? So um, the the thing that caused this particular uh, higher density of stars uh, was uh, an interaction with a previous, uh, with a neighboring galaxy. So what that interaction does is it'll actually create a, a very large potential well in the center of the galaxy. So it's basically, yeah, you have uh, just a stronger gravitational influence around the center of the galaxy and material will uh, funnel towards the center. Okay, cool. We had another question in the chat, William, from Ian Moore, I don't know if if we got to that yet. Uh, the Milky Way stars in front of some of these images are the circles we see actually the apparent size of the star, or um, are the, uh, or is it a saturated pixel and the apparent size is too small to see? 
Yeah, so I would be willing to bet that these uh, stars are not, uh, you know, the actual size uh, that you would see. So it's uh, probably saturated. Uh, yeah, let me let me jump in and, and take that question. Uh, it does look like some stars are bigger than others and smaller in this image, and it it it's actually the way in which we map the intensity of starlight we receive from that star into a, a grayscale color on the screen. And so what we actually see here is that what looks to be a bigger star is actually just a brighter star. So we see more of the shape of the light from the star, uh, but the shape of the light from the star has nothing to do with the physical size of the star. Most of these stars are so far away that even with our biggest telescopes in the world, we still, they would not appear more than a, a single point of light. In fact, the only stars that have actually been in, in, uh, resolved where we can actually see their surfaces requires multiple telescopes working together in a specialized technique called interferometry. Uh, and so no, no single telescope has ever been able to resolve a surface of a star, not even the nearest stars uh, in the Alpha Centauri system. But the light from a star in a telescope is spread out, and it's spread out for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is the twinkle of starlight in the Earth's atmosphere. So when you see a star twinkling, that's, that's not the star in the sky that's twinkling. It's actually the Earth's atmosphere causing the image of the star to shimmer back and forth and, and change and be modulated in brightness due to turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. And so in a way, the Earth's atmosphere looks like, acts like a blur filter and, and spreads the light out. Uh, there's another effect uh, in these images, which is due to quantum mechanics, although it's not showing up with our particular campus telescope, but because the size of the telescope is finite, the primary mirror is, has a finite diameter, and because light comes in as a wave, uh, you can actually get light interfering with itself uh, and that will spread the light out a little bit as well. So we call that a point spread function. But the brighter stars, you can imagine that point spread function is more intense. There's more light coming from that star. And so we see more of the shape of that blurring. And so it appears bigger. And then the fainter stars, we don't see as much of that uh, blurring for the Earth's atmosphere, even though it's getting blurred by an equal amount. It's just dimmer, and so we're seeing less of the wings of that point spread function. So these are not the physical sizes of the stars, but they do actually correlate pretty well with how bright the stars are. Uh, we have another question about the aperture of the telescope and the optical design of the telescope. Uh, we already answered one in the chat. Uh, what about the optical design? Will, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the optical design is a reflector telescope. So that's the simplified version. The technical long version is a Ritchie Creation Cassegrain reflector telescope. So uh, that's just specifying uh, stuff about how the mirrors are curved. But the important thing to remember is that it's just a reflector telescope. So it uses mirrors instead of lenses. So the light will just bounce off uh, the glass surfaces, hence, you know, the mirror. And in a uh, telescope with lenses, a refractor telescope, the light would actually pass through the glass. So that's, that's the difference. So between reflectors and refractors. So ours is a reflector. Hey, great, thanks. Can we look at the cloud cam? Let's see how the clouds look right now. Our half sky camera, as I fondly call it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, how's it looking now? Yeah, let me go ahead and take a new image. Uh, I guess uh, we can see what that does for us. You'll need a longer exposure this time, I think. The sky's darker. Yeah. Try something like that. Is that a star I see? Huh. No, I think those are just bad pixels. Yeah. Uh, it's still pretty cloudy out there. So probably not worth trying to open up. Okay. All right. Thanks, Will. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And uh, if there are any other questions, uh, I can't uh, particularly access the chat right now since I'm sharing my entire screen. Uh, no, I think that's it. I don't see uh, anything else um, in the chat. If you have any other questions, feel free to post them in the chat. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. I know we're competing with a per, uh, perhaps a State of the Union address tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you for joining us in our final virtual evening under the stars. Uh, we have a question about the field of view. Wait, wait, don't leave yet, said uh, Myrna. Uh, is the field of view 26 arc minutes across? Yes, it is. Uh, so have a great night, everyone. And uh, keep a looking up and we will see you hopefully in person in the fall. Please stop by. Even if you're graduating, we welcome you back. And have a great night, everyone. And this brings to a conclusion our public evening under the stars talks for the 2021 academic year. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for your time.